Although 700 years separate us from the response of Robert the Bruce in the community of the realm of Scotland to Pope John XXII, known as the Declaration of Our Brothers, it has not lost the power to surprise and inspire us. Prompted by the threat to Bruce's authority posed by external interference, the Declaration reads more like a prospectus for the ideal medieval polity, a realm of ancient virtue, confident in the authenticity of its Christian origins and the transgressions of its oppressors, and secure in the hegemony of its legitimate ruler. Above all, perhaps, it's a testament of strong leadership focused on the character, the military achievement, and the statesmanship of Robert Bruce. For those of us who are interested in defining a sense of what it is to be Scottish, there's an understandable temptation, perhaps, to treat the Declaration as a talisman of national character or ascribe its significance as a progenitor of expression of constitutional rights. But today, I'll treat the document as a keyhole, a time portal, giving us an extraordinary insight into the minds of a 14th century king and his followers, the ideas that move them, the events that propel them, and the circumstances in which they found themselves in 1320. In this sense, it's a remarkable survivor of a medieval period where a Scottish king's right to rule was soundly tested in combat, but where his moral right was soundly based on logic, endorsed by the collective will of his subjects and presented to the world in language of highly persuasive rhetoric. This, I believe, is its true significance for Scotland. At the time the declaration was conceived, Robert's rule was entering a precarious phase. It's worth reminding ourselves why. By the previous autumn of 1319, despite winning the Battle of Bannockburn only five years before, he was facing a serious threat to legitimacy as king, which must have heightened his sense of vulnerability. His dynasty had suffered a disastrous setback in Ireland, where his surviving brother Edward had been killed at the Battle of Forgot near Dundalk on the 14th of October, 1318. Not only had he lost his surviving brother, his only male heir, but he had also suffered a reversal to his continuous record of military victories since 1307. Robert's continuing need to extend his hegemony in Scotland by granting land and hereditary rights to his followers created resentment among those who had never relinquished their allegiance to John Balliol and his dynasty. And in the early summer of 1320, a conspiracy led by Sir William Soles, planned to launch a coup d'etat against the Bruce dynasty, leading to the return of a Balliol monarchy under the suzerainty of an English of the English crown. Soules and his conspirators were arrested and tried in August. Although this plot never amounted to a serious challenge, Robert could be forgiven for, me for feeling more than a little paranoia at this midway mark in his 23-year-old reign. Other more serious threats were brewing. Following the re-promulgation of his excommunication in 1317, Pope John XXII issued a further papal bull on the 17th of November, 1319, summoning the King and three bishops, William Lamberton of St. Andrews, William Sinclair of Dunkeld, and David Moravia of Murray to attend the papal court at Avignon by the 1st of May, 1320. A fourth bishop, Henry of Aberdeen, was later added to the list. Darkly, the bull hinted at matters touching the realm of Scotland, namely that the said Robert Bruce, who has otherwise treated the Pope's mission with contempt, insulting legates and refusing to accept curial letters, and has resisted for more than a year ecclesiastical sentences against him. And in January 1320, further bulls arrived, renewing this earlier excommunication. It would have been abundantly clear to Robert and his court, however, that the papal onslaught was the result of the incessant diplomatic maneuvering of Edward II against the Scots. Indeed, the wording of the January bull was nothing short of a shameless attempt to scare the Scottish nobility into defecting to English allegiance in order to avoid sharing the fate of their excommunicated king. As a historian Michael Penman explains, inevitably this would have paved the way to the alternative of Edward Balliol 
as a vassal king. It's possible that Robert began to plan his response to the Pope at the council meeting in Berwick in December 13, 1319. With him were the leading nobles, the prelates and knights who acted as the great officers of state, including Randolph Earl of Murray, Sir Robert Keith, Gilbert Hay the Constable, Bernard of Arbroath the Chancellor, and the King's recently appointed Chamberlain, Alexander Fraser. Three letters were to be written, comprising the declaration from the King, his clergy and his barons. Only the barons' letter survives. I think we can safely assume that those drafting the barons' letter were seeking to address several audience at once. The messages were carefully crafted and calibrated. First, they had to convince the, the Pope that Robert Bruce was entitled to be recognized as King of Scots, but they also had to persuade the Vatican that it was the fault of Edward II that a long lasting peace was not forthcoming. And second, they had to secure the allegiance of the principal stakeholders, the nobility and the clergy at a time of great risk to the King and his dynasty. Clearly, the barons acknowledged the concept of a king and the community of the realm joined in common purpose, just as the Charter of Confirmation had been granted to Aberdeen in 1319. This laid out in precise and exacting detail the king's claim to the throne and his right to rule. To him, as to the man by whom salvation has been wrought unto our people, we are bound both by law and by his merits that our freedom may still be maintained, and by him, come what may, we mean to stand. Indeed, to understand the nature of the trust which Robert generated in his followers, we ought to examine the case for his moral authority. A sense of his human qualities emerges from John Barber's episodic poem, The Bruce, which the late Professor Archie Duncan describes as invoking an ideal achieved by chivalry, great valor, and courage. Although the Bruce has come to be read and understood as an existential testament of nationhood, it's not clear, however, if Barber intended his biographical account to be interpreted as such. His field of reference is much more likely to be in the Old Testament. In his, in his hands, the martial exploits of Bruce and Douglas are directly comparable to the revolt of Judas Maccabeus in 160 BC. Freedom from oppression is not in itself a collective responsibility but a personal struggle to avenge the forced dispossession of landed property. And throughout the poem, Bruce's words are addressed to his followers whose lands have been seized either by occupying forces or by his treacherous rivals, such as the Cummins. Thus the leitmotif of the Bruce is not patriotism per se, but conflict and the motivation to fight. As Professor Duncan reminds us, this is a poem about war and despite the rhetoric of freedom and country, patriotism is not its central theme. The real enemy is not the other country or people, but cowardice and treachery. But the tenor of Robert's appeal to his clergy was equally important to his barons. We know for a fact that numerous acts of piety accompanied his reign. Michael Penman notes that his saintly observances as a politician, lord and king, could also reflect quite genuine personal acts of faith by Robert Bruce, the man. Indeed, as Robert's reign progressed, there's a strong sense of a community identity focused on him as the leader of a people blessed by God. Something of this phenomenon is captured in the epitaph for the king written by the Chancellor Abbot Bernard, which appears in Scottish Chronicle as gentle as Andrew, sacred food for the soul of his subjects. In 1309, at his first parliament in, in St. Andrews, Robert had indeed received the unequivocal endorsement of the church as contained in the Declaration of the Clergy. The historian of medieval philosophy, Alexander Brody, suggests that both 1309 and 1320 declarations ought to be considered together. The former established important principles, which will provide the latter with its focus on the idea of sovereignty growing upwards from the soil rather than descending from the heavens. It advanced the concept of a consensual sovereignty where Robert, by the knowledge and consent of the people, was received as king so he might restore the defects of the kingdom and correct things needed correcting and might steer those that lacked guidance. And Brodie concludes that in the early 14th century, Scotland was uniquely placed to take advantage of contemporary theological scholarship on the subject of reciprocating royal and papal power. 
indeed prompted by a dispute over sovereign rights to taxation of clergy between Pope Boniface VIII and the King of France, scholars at the University of Paris sought to clarify the limits of temporal and spiritual power. In 1302, Jean Quidot, a follower of Thomas Aquinas, published a treatise seeking to solve the controversy. And he claimed that as the Pope was elected by men, well, he could be removed by men. Well, for good reasons, of course. In the same year as Quidot wrote his thesis, John Dun Scotus arrived at the University of Paris. Scotus, a Franciscan theologian born in Berwickshire in the reign of Alexander III, developed his scholarship on logic and moral philosophy at Oxford University. Confronted by the same papal controversy that exercised Kidor, Scotus concurred that a ruler's authority is conditional on aimable popular agreement, thus providing the basis of a social contract and preempting John Locke's second treatise of government by nearly 400 years. Once he had established the basis of a civil authority, Scotus was able to address the issue of property rights posing the rhetorical question, is a penitent thief bound to restitution? Brody believes that Scotus may have had the Plantagenet colonization of Scotland under Edward I in his sights. And he suggests, it is natural to think that Scotus has in mind such things that an ordinary thief might steal. He may also have in mind a non-ordinary thief, such as a king who has stolen another country and who cannot be a true penitent unless he restores it to its rightful owners. Known throughout well-educated well -educated Europe as the subtle doctor, it's tempting to think that Scotus's fundamental question of propriety sits at the heart of the Declaration of Arbroath's assertion of moral right, the right of a kingdom not to be not dominated and bullied intermin interminably by a powerful neighbor, the right of a king to protect his people's freedom from being stolen or usurped by foreigners. But above, above all, the declaration proves the power of rhetoric and the use of language to win an argument without recourse to force. And it also demonstrates the way in which language in the right hands should be used to give inspiration for all time, such as Winston Churchill's wartime speeches, which mobilized the English language and sent it into battle a spearhead of hope for Britain and the world. So if it's possible to identify the moment when the soul of a nation first makes its appearance, in the case of Scotland, it may have emerged in the six years that lay between the Battle of Bannockburn and the Declaration of Arbroath. As we have revealed today, although the Declaration has become a perennial testament or the free of freedom, the actual battlefield was once threatened with oblivion. In 1931, my grandfather intervened to stop Stirling Council from forcibly acquiring the site for a council housing scheme. He engaged the writer John Buchan to write a fundraising appeal for the newly created National Trust for Scotland. Buchan was in the midst of writing The Four Adventures of Richard Hannick but he laid aside his pen to save such an important field of victory. Bannockburn is a key event in history, he wrote. For Scotland, it is the proudest military event in her records. It gave her freedom. It created a national self-consciousness. It enabled her to find her soul. It left her to work out her own destiny. And when union with her old antagonist came about, she entered as an equal, free and unconquered. So perhaps we should recognize the importance of the declaration in similar terms. It was conceived primarily as a di diplomatic weapon, but potentially with far more firepower than the Scots could have ever hoped to deploy on the field of battle. And as a medieval document, it is recognized increasingly as one of the most intelligent and insightful instruments of diplomacy of its time, weaving as it does the calm logic of a superior moral proposition with a language of pure patriotism. And it will forever remind us of one of the proudest moments of our history. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference today.